Um, today's message is called Awestruck. And I want to ask you, when is the last time you stood in awe before who God was? I want to share with you a moment when I was so amazed, so awed by God. It was when I was a high school pastor, and it was one of our summer retreats. I don't fully remember which one it was. All of them kind of <laughs> become one in my head. But I just remember God was so good, and He moved powerfully. And I've been to Big Bear so many times. It's practically my second home. If you want to know anything about Big Bear, like, ask me, okay? <laughs> but that was a one time where I was driving back in the van. I had like 13, 14 high school kids knocked out. And I'm driving down, and the clouds had descended down to the top of the mountains, and I think to this point in my life, it was the most beautiful picture, beautiful scenery I've ever seen up to this point in my life. It was so awe-inspiring. It was so majestic. The first thought that entered my head was, wow, maybe heaven looks kind of like this. And honestly, I was so tempted to pull over just so I could stop and admire. Because, you know, when you're driving and the road's curvy light, you almost have to steal glances, but you have to keep paying attention to the road. And I just, I just wanted to just stop. But I also felt like I couldn't because there's really not too many places to stop. I mean, I got high school students in, in the van and we need to come back down. But I just remember thinking to myself, God, this is so beautiful. Your creation is so amazing. And how much more beautiful the one who made this, the creator behind all of this. It wasn't just the scenery, of course. It was just everything that had led up to that point where I felt so in love with God and amazed by who He was in the way that He moved in the hearts of His people. And those of you guys 30 and below who grew up in this church, you know, went through me at some point, you know, fortunately or unfortunately. But there's many of you that I see you even now and today. And when I see you, I don't just see you in your moment now. But like there are times that are seared into my head when I felt like you were so in love with God and awed by who He was. And for some of us, maybe that's a continuing journey where we continue to be amazed by who God is. But for some of us, maybe it's something that we need to recover and come back into. One of the things that I always found interesting when I've been to the mission field, usually places where they're a little persecuted, so the Christians are like the real deal. And one of the things that I noticed was that they never call God the living God because at that point it's really redundant for them because the reality of God, how alive He is, they seem to experience it on a daily basis. So there's no real need to call Him the living God. He is simply God Himself who is so alive and who is the Lord of the universe. Later, to, uh, later in this message, I do want to talk about the love of God. But honestly... I, I know, of course, we talk about identity because a lot of us are broken and, and sometimes we condemn ourselves and we don't really see who we are as God sees us and, and we need a truth spoken into us uh, it, it because we, you know, like devalue us. But sometimes I feel like what many of us need even more so is to be humbled by God. 
So today, honestly, my hope is that the greatness, the majesty, the glory of who God is would be highlighted and just how tiny you are before Him. Because when we don't see Him as we should, the God who is holy, 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 When something is repeated three times in the scriptures, basically understand it like there's like a hundred exclamation points right after. That's really what it means. And what that meant was that God was not like us. He was completely other. And then as the scripture says, our God who dwells in unapproachable light and to understand him really to be the God of the universe that we are so small and tiny compared to where the scriptures say that our lives are but merely a breath, that you and I are like, we're just grass. You know, it kind of comes up or a flower and it just withers the next moment. Quite frankly, none of us probably know what our great grandfather looked like. We probably don't know his name. They're just forgotten. That's just the reality of how it is. But to really, for for us to come into understanding that God would move in us to help us to understand how exceedingly great, awesome, glorious, mighty, all of these things that the scriptures use to describe Him, that that would be seared into our hearts so that our over-familiarity with Him would not make us just kind of take His presence for granted. If we could put up the PowerPoint, please. As it says in Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, For the Lord, your God, is God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial. It's a title that we're familiar with, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, And I just remember one time meditating upon that. It's like Jesus is going to return one day as a conquering king. And I thought, what does that mean, king of kings, lord of lords? And in my mind, I imagine, and and it's going to be a reality, all the great kings of the past, right? Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Hammurabi, that one day they're going to bow before Jesus. Adolf Hitler, FDR, Joseph Stalin, all of them, because he is the king of all the kings, and there will be no one to compare. Nothing will be able to stand before his presence. If we go to the next slide, in fact, this is King Nebuchadnezzar's very confession in Daniel 4.35. One of the greatest kings of the ancient Near East. And of course, we know because of his pride, God humbled him so that he would actually eat grass like the cow. And when God brought him back to his senses, this is how he declared. He said, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand and and say to him, what have you done? That the nearly 8 billion people who are alive here on earth means nothing. There's only one God, one eternal creator, and everyone else is like grass. And even if we were to all stand together and protest against God, it would just absolutely mean nothing. Because we're here, and we're gone tomorrow. Do we understand, do we recognize, really, that He is the eternal God of the universe, and you and I are so, so, so tiny? Which is why the scriptures remind us to humble ourselves before Him. I want to ask, do we genuinely do that? Do we really 
humble ourselves before this great and glorious and majestic King. I wanted to bring our attention to two things. Okay, one more recent, two current events that happened. Some of us probably read in the news, the James Webb Telescope, right? Just uh, the the technology behind it apparently is just mind-blowing, where it can catch the infrared rays and to be able to see the galaxies. So like a thousand times what the Hubble Telescope was, which was revolutionary, right? And I'm not an astronomy guy, by the way. My eight-year-old son is. If you want to know how many moons okay, orbit Jupiter, don't ask me, ask him. Okay? And whatever he tells you, trust me, it's right. Okay? <laughs> he, yeah, every, I learn about these things. I'm not into it. But I just thought, hey, it's in the news. I was, re- I was looking at some of these pictures, and I couldn't help but be in awe. And I want to show you a few things. And you don't have to be into this stuff, but we'll make a point of it. Let's go to the next slide. And... This is actually the old Hubble telescope, and this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, with the, planet, the planets that we have, right? Earth, you know, Neptune, Mars, Venus, you name it. And that's a picture of that galaxy. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, that is actually the picture of the universe. So we don't know where the Milky Way is, but it's one of those dots. And what astronomers have discovered is that it's literally trillions of galaxies in our universe, which is why sometimes they've been calling it now the multiverse, okay? Let's go to the next slide. And they're just, it's a contrast. So, you know, that side is the uh, James Webb Telescope. The other side is the Hubble, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Now, zip through it. And why they're so excited about it and think this is going to change science is that they can actually see stars forming when they, you know, they, they, Stars are continuously forming, and there's clusters. They are, you know, uh, exploding together. They're, you know, and it's creating these different kind of, uh, you know, merging galaxies and all these kinds of things. And they're able to actually see it happen now. Let's go to the next slide. And some of you may be familiar with some of these images. That, I mean, they've been all over the news. Let's go to the next slide. I, I can't really explain it though. You know, just just watch and I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, it's just. <laughs> Just admire. Let's go to the next slide. And that's like the details through which they can actually see things. And next slide. And that's pretty much it. (laughs) But you know, it boggles our mind how huge this universe is. You guys know, of course, the fastest thing is light, the speed of light. In one second, light can circle around the earth over seven times. It's pretty fast. And you know, scientists have gone to calling things because the universe is so huge, they had devised a thing called a light year, right? So the light that can circle around the earth over seven times in a one second, it's like how long that light It's how far it can travel in one year. That's called one light year. It comes out to about six quintillion miles. Okay? And if you don't know that measure, I mean, none of us really can grasp it, right? (laughs) Okay? So one light year is six quintillion miles. And now, with these telescopes, we can see stars that are literally millions of light years away. Here we are, we live on one planet, we've never been able to verify if there's, no one has been able to show that there's life on any other planets. And then that little galaxy we live in, or actually it's pretty huge, but that Milky Way is just one out of trillions. And some of us who are very practical might be thinking, God, what's the point of that? You just need the earth, the sun, moon, that's all it is. But I just believe that it's a, reflection of who God is. God didn't just do it to like just because he was bored, but I believe that that's just a reality of who he is. He is the 
infinite one. He is the eternal one. And all of us, of course, conceptually, we understand what eternity is, but none of us, because our minds are so finite, can actually grasp and understand eternity. (laughs) If we did, and we understood Jesus' promises, we probably would be living very differently. And I share this with you, and maybe some of you guys are like, oh, that's, those are cool pictures, but I'm not into astronomy. I, I mean, I'm not either. But I do think that there are times when we need to actually stop and think about these things. How small we really are, how infinite it seems these, this universe is, and the creator behind that. Some of us, quite frankly, if I showed you, like if someone drove in a Bentley, you would be more in awe than any of these things. Some of us are in awe of that extra zero in our bank accounts. All of it will come to nothing. When is the last time you were awestruck by God? Again, I have witnessed some of you being in awe of God. Is that something that we can continue to experience? A living God, His glory for us to really be amazed by the God whom we serve. Let's go to the next slide. Again, our, I, I want to ask us this question from Isaiah 29, 13. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And again, I just want us like, to just be honest. Like There's no condemnation, but it is something for us to think about. Because I I honestly can say that I've probably been guilty of this more times than I wish to admit. Again, are we really here to seek God's face? Are we here understanding that we really are in the presence of the God of the universe? Or are you just biding the time when I will just simply end so that you could eat something? Let's go to the next slide. For some of us, this might, you know, hit home a little bit more. So I love nature. I love the beauty of nature. So I just put some pictures, my favorites, okay, that I could find on Google. So I, don't ask me where it is. I don't know. It just looks nice, okay? Let's go to the next slide. And even just a bird flying, I think if we were to stop and think about the wonder of it all, I think it's really amazing. Sometimes we lose sight of that because we live in a concrete jungle and we only get amazed by things that human hands make. Let's go to the next slide. I just thought it was an amazing picture of this muscular horse <laughs> galloping on the beach. And the uh, next slide, uh, that's just, uh, that's a real creature, okay? My son taught me. It's called the blobfish, and it was voted as the ugliest creature in the world. And apparently, they live so deep in the ocean that the water pressure, like when you bring it out into the surface, because there's no more water pressure, it the face just kind of sags like that, okay? But apparently they're delicious, okay? So let's go to the next slide. One of my favorite authors uh, and pastors, A.W. Tozer, who was an amazing pastor in Chicago back in the mid-1900s, this is what he wrote. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. 
Worship is pure or base, as a worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God Himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. Beloved brothers and sisters, let me ask you, how great is God in your heart? I know we can't, we can't make God any greater. <laughs> he's just, he's the great I am. But in your heart, is he exalted? In your heart, is he really great? In your heart, is he king of kings and lord of lords? Because one of the things that we need us to understand, that word Lord, it wasn't just something that people said to Jesus back then. It was a common word, and it literally means master. Because it's not a democracy. There was slaves, there was, you know, masters and, and so forth. So when you call someone that word, kurios, it, mean, it meant master. And here it is. What, what's crazy to me is that they understood even human masters, but for us, we will call Jesus Lord, but we don't really live our lives or really consider God to be our master. God calls you to do something. He speaks to you in His Word. So it says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, pre present your request to God. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. But then we look at our circumstances and say, well, I have to be anxious. And we think nothing of declaring to God that we know better than Him. We think nothing when God tells us to go make disciples of all nations to say, okay, God, no or wait. It's just crazy to me. Even the winds and the waves obey him. And then there's this one creature who actually were given the very life and spirit of God and bear his image who say, no, master. And that doesn't even make sense, right? That's a paradox in and of itself. No, master. But some of us, I think that's, Maybe what our lives actually look like. Is Jesus the master over your life? Is he the master over your finances? Is he the Lord over your time? Is he really the master over every relationship that we have? Because these kinds of worldly thinkings that seep into us, are very American values that have nothing to do with God's word. Like, it's my money, so I can spend whatever I want. On a legal sense, you would be correct, but that would be a complete opposite of what Jesus actually says in his word. Where we're never called owners, but only called stewards. Someone who manages somebody else's. It's not your money, it's his. And you will be judged based on how you manage his money. If all you care about is your own big house and your Porsche and going on nice vacations, well, you have something else coming. You're going to have to stand before God's presence and give an account. And here's a crazy thing to me. You know, all throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, every time God met somebody or even one of his angels met someone, all of them responded in the same way. And they fell prostrate, face down, and they were scared to death. And when we talk about the fear of God, sometimes we say it in a way where it's like, oh, it's not like fear, like you're scared of Him because we're, and then it's like it's more reverence and so forth. And actually that word means being terrified, And that's what we all see all throughout the scriptures. They act like people who are terrified. They think they're going to die, or they certainly think they deserve to die now after what they've seen. 
and they can't lift up their heads. So, I want to ask, is God really great in your heart, or is He kind of rather small? Because I think how great He truly is in our hearts is reflected in the way that we live our daily lives, and it's even reflected in the way that we come here in corporate worship. One of the things, of course, when I go speak to youth students, right, I always tell them to put away their phones. And I believe there's an there's a, um, importance to that. You know, teaching young kids to really come before God in reverence and to not take worship lightly because we see all throughout the scriptures and in church history, whenever the people of God took the worship of God lightly, everything crumbled underneath them. How pure or base your worship is depends on your, how you view God, and it shows. So I do tell them that, but at the end of the day, sometimes I feel like those are just the symptoms. You know what I mean? It doesn't get to the heart of it. I mean, you know, I could tell them to put away their phones, but I can't really make them worship, right? I guess if I scare them enough, I can make them sing. I, I don't know, but like, what's the point of that? Because worship, it really comes from the heart, right? Like, when we see the angels, when we see the creatures, when we see the all tribe tongue and all the peoples of the earth, they cannot help but worship because they see the greatness of God and it's just, they can't help it. Some of us, I think we treat God like, you know that really ugly girl who likes you? You're not that interested. And you'd go, rather go after other girls, but like, if it doesn't work out, you feel like, well, I always have that backup option. That's why when you're in school, you have to be a responsible student, so then, you know, like Jesus, it's like kind of the side, you know, he's like panchan, you know, like one of them. Right? So one of the side dishes in your meal. And then, of course, when you work, you know, you have to focus on your career because you're being a good, responsible Christian. And then you have your family, and then you have to focus on that. And then you. Have... And then Jesus is not your master. Yeah, he's that ugly girl who likes you. He should just be there. It's almost like we treat him like the way rebellious teenagers treat their parents. You know, they'll just do whatever they want and they'll just feel like, well, they're my parents so they have to love me so they have to do good stuff for me. But it's not the right picture and certainly not what the scriptures teach us. Let's go to the next slide. A.W. Tozer says this, a man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy and God's heaviest grief because we bear his image. We have his spirit, his life. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and um, I uh, want to bring attention to the other big <laughs> event that happened, right? Uh, the Roe v. Wade reversal. And I actually shared this at a church in L.A. recently. Familiar passage. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. 
Next slide. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What does that mean? That God is the one who created us. I always explain, I was explaining to some of these kids, it's not just God is creative or born. Creation is an act of love. Like an artist would love their work or there's an affection that a musician in the song that they write. But the reason why we believe that uh, sex is within marriage between two people who have committed themselves for the rest of their lives is because that's the only context that's worthy enough to bring forth life. So when God creates us, it means that He loves us. But there's another thing, though. If we go back to that slide, uh, verse 13, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And what that also means, before a single day of mine came to be, it was already written. You know what that means? That God owns us. In Ephesians 1, 4, it says, Before the foundation of the world, He loved us and chose us. That's wild if you actually think about it. Before He created the world, He already knew us. None of us chose to be born. None of us choose when we die. We're just, I mean, but see, I mean, we read this past week in the Bible time, Jeremiah 1, 5, when God tells Jeremiah, before I knit you together in your mother's womb, I already knew you. Man, like God, like He owns us. Everything is in His hand and His control. And in light of those verses, like how can we follow the ways of the world and not understand. So, so I, I'm, I'm in LA, right? And they're telling me, this is not Orange County. It's not as conservative there, okay? Those of you guys who know me well know that I am like definitively not Republican and I'm definitely not Democrat. I, those are not labels that I, it's not important to me. My fidelity is to Christ and His Word. And so for me, like, I, I mean, it's huge. This is huge. Like, how can you, in light of those verses, be pro-choice? It doesn't make any sense. God knew you before. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And then you know what they told me? It's like, wow, you spoke strongly. I hear people like, and I'm like, I mean, it's okay because I'm not a politician. I just speak from God's word, what the Bible says, and then like, I'm not responsible anymore. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's what I do, and, 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 but then, you know, some people are like, oh, you spoke strongly. I was because, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I wasn't backing any party. I was just, wow. I knew you before you came to be. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and, and he is our master and our father. So in the scriptures, it tells us that we are treasured by God, His special possession. And I remember when my daughter was born, I was talking to this older pastor, and he asked me, do you love your wife? And you know, what husband's going to say, no? We all know what the right answer is, so it's like, yeah, of course, okay? I mean, almost reflexively without thinking, right? But then he rephrased it and he said, do you treasure your wife the way you treasure your daughter? And at that moment, it was hard for me to just give a pat yes answer. Because love is kind of overplayed, so it's easy to say, but then when you treasure something, I remember even before my daughter was a week old and I was infatuated with her. 
actually, the fear of God came upon me. I remember specifically when we were doing morning prayer, this was back in the high school room. And I came with my head like, my hair was all crazy. Thank God I'm not a KM pastor. Um, I didn't get much sleep at night, you know, and, and, and I was there and it struck me like, God, I don't know if I love you or my daughter more. And that's like, um, disturbed me to the core. And I remember praying to him, God, may I never, ever, ever love her more than you. Because you are my father, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Even she is a gift from your hand. And for me to raise her rightly, I have to love you more. That's the best thing I could do for her. So when Jesus tells us that we are to hate our father, mother, our spouse, our children, and follow him, he says that very confidently because I believe he is that worthy. But I believe he says that confidently too because he loves us that way, way more than even your own parents do or your spouse do or your children do. So he can confidently declare that, telling us to follow him. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And I remember that was also something I thought about after I had my son. And I thought, wow, like I really think push came to shove. Of course, I can't prove it until, I mean, you know, it's just words. But like in my heart, I felt like, yeah, I think I could lay down my life for another person. You know, push came to shove. But like I imagine laying down my son to save somebody else. And just the thought of it just brought tears to my eyes, and I, I, I just can't imagine. I, 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 I don't think I could ever go there in life. But God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. It pleased God to crush Him, He who was without sin, so that we may become the righteous of God. So honestly, telling people to put away their phones, it's just a symptom. It's the right thing to teach, but it's just a symptom. It's about the heart. Is God worthy of your worship? Is God exceedingly great in your heart? See, when we are told that the God of the universe loves you, the one who created all of that stuff, that he loves you, it still doesn't hit us. <laughs> because when that ugly girl likes you, it's not that valuable, right? It's like, oh, that's nice, you know? But hey, let me move on with my life and pursue other things that I prefer. But when we get a glimpse of just how exceedingly great and awesome he is. And he looks at you and say, I love you. It changes everything. And so that's my heart posture. It's like, God, like, again, I don't want to just say to him, I love you, but like, do I really treasure God above everything in my life? So honestly, this past month has been a real struggle for me because it dawned on me that it doesn't matter whether I'm a pastor, right? Because Jesus' command to us was not to go do a bunch of stuff, but then the greatest commandment just boiled down to loving him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And it dawned on me that that was not me, and I was not okay with that, because that's literally the only thing. Like, I can fail in other things in life, you know, I don't need to know how many moons, you know, orbit Jupiter, but like the one thing I really need, that's the one thing that I really, really, really need. And, and why I had this moment was because last month I, 
I went to Iraq, okay, for a mission with one of our pastors and one of our elders. It, it was like a scouting trip to see if it was a viable place where we could do short-term mission trips in and bring teams to. Um, right bef- you know, before that mission trip, I uh, got into a little fight with my wife, okay? Basically, she had COVID with my youngest one, and we're trying to be careful not to spread it, and I thought she wasn't being careful enough, and I was like, what are you doing? Uh, and apparently, I think I said it in a lot meaner way than that, uh, and uh, so we fought, and I was in Iraq, and I, I did my best to, you know, be there in the moment, but I didn't feel good about that. And I came back, and what gripped me was not even my relationship with her. What gripped me was, do I really fear the Lord? Do I really love Him with all that I have? And if I did, would this be the reality of my situation? You know, all those of you guys who did premarital counseling through me, you know, I hope some of that was helpful. But in reality, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's not church lingo. I'm not just saying that. Because when I started to have that inner conflict, it dawned on me that when I was so filled with the Spirit of God, I never fought with my wife. If anything, I feel like she respected me tons. But sometimes I'm not consistent. I don't know why. Could I have the worship team come up? Let's go to the next slide and I'll bring this to a close. Your attitude. It's a famous verse. Philippians 2. It was a hymn that was sung in the first century church about Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." Pastor Kim used to always say this. He would say, the distance between us and God is infinitely greater than the difference between us and a little ant. Jesus, who was God, made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a, remember that word servant is a really, really, really bad translation. It actually is slave. Being made in human likeness and humbled himself even to death on a cross. He was infinite God and he did this. We're actually nothing, but we think the whole world revolves around you. What a coincidence. It's like almost 8 billion people on earth and you're it. You're the one that the world revolves around. And then the person next to you is like, no, wait, I'm it. We're just grass. Here one day and gone the next. Can we humble ourselves before the Lord? Is what we need not simply financial security or a future wife, but a clearer vision of who God is so that we could live our lives accordingly. May I invite us all to stand before the presence of God together at this time? For some of us, maybe we become over familiar with the machinations of church, you know? 
what really bothered me this past month was, as I was wrestling, was, you know, I'm pretty consistent. I mean, I, I'm quite consistent with my devotional life, right? So then I read the Word, I pray, and start off the morning that way. And then the rest of my working day, I do church work, right? So I'm thinking I'm good. <laughs> what's holier than that? Give God your morning and seeking Him and then do church work. Like, what's better than that? But like, it started to dawn on me that how I was living the remainder of my life, I couldn't confidently say, like, I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I couldn't confidently say, that Jesus was really the master of every aspect of my life, starting with my relationship with my wife. I'm not too scared about failing in a lot of things, but if the one thing that God has called me to do is to love Him with all that I have, and it wasn't a pie in the sky, it wasn't just a nice suggestion, but my master told me that that was the one thing I needed and to really love my neighbor as myself, then uh, my goodness, I don't want to be a pastor who fails in that. You know what I mean? I'd rather just let go of this office or, or position, but I mean, I just want to be able to do this rightly. You know what I'm saying? So, I'd like us to take this moment to humble ourselves before the Lord. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to whom every tongue shall confess and every knee will bow. Let's take this time to pray because it's not something that we can just conjure up ourselves, right? The scriptures tell us that you would have power of the Holy Spirit to open your spiritual eyes. It's always coming back to that place of asking God for that. Can we take this time to pray, Lord, I want you to be exceedingly great in my life. God, you are my master. And I want my life to reflect that. I don't want to do my own thing. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are your ways so much higher than my ways and your thoughts higher than mine. And I want to know what you think. I want to know your ways. Can that be our prayer together, brothers and sisters? So let's take this time to humble ourselves, recognize God as our master, and let's pray that we would have a greater revelation of who He is, just how awesome, great, glorious, and mighty He is, that he, he is the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the Ancient of Days, the Holy One of Israel, who will always be worshipped, that all the creatures in the heavenly places and all the people down below shall lift up His name and glorify Him and declare that there is none other. And let's pray that that God will give us that revelation of our hearts because our, for some of us, God has been entirely too small in your hearts and we need Him to be exalted in the depths of our hearts. So let's pray that together, shall we? Let's call upon His name. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.